Hi, everyone. Welcome to the CR event today. We appreciate everyone joining us for this discussion. I'm Matt Petrassi with Climate Advisors, which is part of the CR Consortium with Aid Environment and Profundo. We provide sustainability risk analysis for investors, banks, and NGOs. Today, we'll be discussing the rise of palm oil in Latin America and the sustainability implications of this growth. In light of environmental and social sustainability concerns in relation to palm oil from Southeast Asia, several Latin American countries see the opportunity to open export markets while also presenting palm oil from the region as a more sustainable option. However, social and environmental sustainability concerns are also prominent in the Latin American sector and require ongoing due diligence. And in Brazil, while palm oil production in the Amazon has relatively lo lower environmental impacts than soy and beef, palm oil expansion has been linked to deforestation, fires, exploitive labor conditions, and land disputes. Our main speakers today will be Sarah Dross of Aid Environment and Barbara Cooper and Gerard Reich of Profundo. And now to begin the presentation, I'll hand it over to Barbara. Thanks, Matt. <clears throat> so as uh, Matt just mentioned, um, we are going to first have a look at uh, the Latin American uh, region, including Central and South America, and uh, the developments around uh, palm oil that um, have been observed there in the last 10 years, roughly. And then uh, uh, um, zooming in into the situation in Brazil. Um, next slide, please. So palm oil production in Latin America has more than doubled during the last 10 years, reaching a total of around 4.6 million tons this year. However, as, as you can see from this graphic, um, the dominance of Southeast Asian producers, and then especially Indonesia and Malaysia, means that um, despite Latin America being the second largest producing region globally, it only accounts for a combined share of around 6%. 0.4% of the global production. So that's the countries marked with a, a red frame below Colombia as the largest producer in Latin America, and then Guatemala, Brazil, Honduras, Ecuador, Costa Rica, Mexico, and Peru as the more relevant uh, producers um, on the continent. This share could become more material though in, in the coming years as a further production increase is forecasted. Um, driven by, on the one hand, um, uh, demand for, um, for the, from food, food markets, so um, uh, edible oil, and also for processing into, into food products, as well as um, biodiesel markets, and um, uh, also export markets uh, in the region, so neighboring countries in Latin America, as well as Europe as an export market. Uh, the... Um, there are also opportunities for further expansion in the light of Southeast Asia reaching a limit in further expansion, among others due to the strength and sustainability requirements and concerns by importers um, related to yeah, what we have all seen over the years, um, um, stories about deforestation, peat development, social issues in the Southeast Asian uh, supply chain. So beyond um, productivity increases, it's difficult to, to increase production there and countries in Latin America could tap into that, into that market. Um, next slide, please. So this is an overview of the eight um, larger, well, from large to somewhat smaller producing countries in Latin America um, and developments during the last 10 years. Colombia is clearly the largest producer. Colombia is now the fourth lar the largest producer in the world, um, still compared to Southeast Asia on a small level. Um, Colombia has seen a slight dip in the last two years and some other countries as well, but overall it has um, seen uh, quite an enormous increase in production. So have, for example, Mexico and Peru, although on a much smaller level. Some other countries um, have seen st stagnating developments or even decreases in production, which um, is influenced by a range of um, external factors, like in the case of Ecuador and Costa Rica, a plant disease called bud rot disease, which has impacted uh, yields quite substantially. 
and in the case of Honduras, uh, adverse weather conditions um, in the last years, which also had quite a um, strong impact on, uh, on palm oil production. Um, for Colombia, as the, the fourth largest palm oil producer globally, a further increase is expected in the coming years, according to forecasts that could be up to 25% growth to 2 million tons by 2030, which is currently projected. Um, there are some important differences between the different countries. Obviously, we're looking at a, at a huge continent and uh, the, the production systems are quite different. There's, for example, differences in the role played by smallholder or small and medium-sized producers versus large um, plantation companies. Um, if, uh, just to look at a couple of examples, for, for example, in Guatemala, smallholders account for a bit more than half of production, while large family-held corporations are quite important. In comparison to that, uh, Ecuador, for example, is uh, very much dominated by small and medium-sized producers, which account for more than 90% of production there. Uh, a country like Brazil has some large producers, and, and at the same time, the, the country's sustainable palm oil production program also aims to incentivize them to involve smallholder farmers through contract farming. So there are quite large differences, which is also reflected in the yields showing um, differing levels, which is partly influenced by the fact that in general, countries with a high share of smallholders have slightly, tend to have um, lower yields simply because there's less resources than often for inputs and, and high quality planting materials. Yeah, that impacts the overall output then. The next slide, please. Um, yeah, this is just to, to give a, a, an overall impression of the market. Um, in, in Latin America, the regional re market remains the most important destination of palm oil production. Um, it is overall uh, a net exporting uh, region by now. I will get back to that in a moment. Um, there are imports of roughly 1 million tons in the last year and 2.3 million tons of exports, but the the larger part is actually consumed in the region with often um, trade between neighboring countries playing a role. The pie chart there just gives a very rough indication of the, the different sectors using it. So on average with actually quite large uh, differences between different countries, food products account for around 45%, around half of consumption goes into food products. Um, other consumer goods are quite important, around 35%, and then energy at 20%, but that can um, be very different. For example, in um, Colombia, the share of energy products is quite a bit higher. In other countries, that plays a much lower role. So yeah, there's, there's large differences between, between these countries. The next slide, please. So looking at the energy sector, which is actually quite interesting because it plays an increasingly important role. Um, the, the role of palm oil as a feedstock in biofuels differs a lot between different countries. In some countries, it plays no role at all. In others, like for example, Colombia, around almost half of the crude palm oil consumption was accounted for by biodiesel in 2020, which was due to a B10 blend, so a 10% blend in 2020 and a further increase to B12 this year. Um, in other countries, like for example, in Brazil, Brazil has um, the, the so-called Renova Bio policy was implemented in 2020 as the, the national biofuels policy. It, yeah, that played a role in revitalizing demand for edible oils-based feedstocks, including palm oil, even though soybean oil is by far dominant in comparison, um, while palm oil is still uh, mostly used as an edible oil and in other applications. Um, generally in biofuels, sugarcane-based ethanol is still much more important, but the role of biodiesel is increasing. And the Renova bio policy is meant as a way of offsetting, um, of um, reducing GHG emissions and at the same time 
reducing the dependency on fossil fuel imports. So there, there are incentives given to increase the share of um, biofuels. Um, and while palm oil also in Brazil remains, a, still has a small share in the biodiesel production, the overall increase in biodiesel output means that also the volume of palm oil that is used for it has increased quite substantially in the last couple of years. There have also been um, moves by the Brazilian government to, um, uh, to provide incentives for, for the use of um, uh, renewable energies in, in power generation. And among others, uh, investments have been made in several thermoelectric power plants in uh, the Amazon, Amazon state of Roraima, which use palm oil as a primary feedstock. And yeah, it can be assumed that, that um, demand will further increase. And yeah, as mentioned, Sarah will look in more detail at the Brazilian situation in a moment. In Ecuador, first generation biodiesel is currently still too expensive to be competitive, but the government aims to reduce the dependency on fossil fuel imports and has um, implemented a new oil palm law, which includes also provisions for the promotion of palm oil based biodiesel and a B2 blend, which is low, but means that the demand for palm oil will increase likely in the future. In uh, Peru, on the other hand, the, outpan, uh, the output of palm oil-based biodiesel has seen an increase in the last years after cheap imports from Argentina have been stopped with anti-dumping duties and um, that, that actually revitalized the production of uh, palm oil-based biodiesel. There is, however, a natural limit in, in some ways because of the natural conditions there as the high altitudes and low temperatures mean that the blend rate has to be has to remain limited uh, as palm oil solidifies too easily. The next slide please. Mm -hmm. Yeah as mentioned before um, trade is playing an um, increasingly a, a role uh, for palm oil from Latin America. Um, if we look at this graphic, um, the, the regional trade is dominant, that's the green colored bars, um, so there is a lot of trade between the different countries, and at the same time, the role of especially Europe as an expert market has increased in the last years, that's the blue colored um, bars. Um, so, for example, um, Ecuador exports mostly to neighboring countries especially to Colombia, and Colombia in turn is among the important exporters um, to other countries and regions, uh, along with Guatemala and Honduras. On the other hand, Brazil and Mexico cannot yet meet their domestic demand for palm oil and therefore import quite large volumes from the region as well as in these two cases also from Southeast Asia. So um, yeah, there are very very different profiles also in relation to trade um, with palm oil. The next slide, please. So this is just to give a very, very short impression of um, the way that also the Latin American palm oil supply chain is linked to international markets by now. So these are only, this is only one producer per country with a selection of links to uh, mid and downstream actors um, that um, are yeah, mostly um, operating globally. It's just to show that yeah, there are a lot of links to the international market already, and those will likely only become more in the coming years. The next slide, please. So yeah, if we look at um, the, the social and environmental um, implications from um, palm oil production in, in the profiled countries. Um, it is clear that the link between deforestation and oil palm expansion is considerably weaker overall than in Southeast Asia. Um, there is a, a different land use pattern that can be observed. The expansion over the years has mostly occurred on already deforested and converted land, often from cattle ranching. In some countries, also from crop production or banana plantations, for example, in Honduras, um, 
quite a lot of it comes from banana plantations. Um, but overall, the expansion of agricultural production as such remains a threat to valuable ecosystems um, in, the, in the Latin American region, and that also includes palm oil. A contributing factor is um, that expanding into forested areas is often cheaper than developing plantations on already deforested and degraded lands, which could also mean that in some parts um, still forest is converted for also palm oil cultivation. Um, and when, uh, when looking at the fact that um, most of the expansion is taking place on already converted land, it certainly also has to be kept in mind that that means that other uses are potentially pushed further into forested areas, in this case, mostly cattle, because a lot of it comes from uh, pastures and also other crop production may be pushed. And with this, it could be an indirect driver also. In several of the, the countries, voluntary sustainability agreements have been, um, have been agreed on uh, with industry actors during the yeah, just last couple of years. Um, but there are still social and environmental breaches that are being observed. Uh, the next slide, please. So just to give a couple of examples, which is, yeah, um, um, yeah just to, to um, give an idea of what, what may be um, the issues, is that if we look, for example, at Colombia, uh, palm oil is not a key driver of forest loss. It has, yeah, that's much more related to, again, cattle ranching. But it is a country with very high deforestation rates during the last 20 years. And um, as palm oil expansion is mostly taking place on these pastures, it's overall played a relatively small role in, um, in forest loss. Um, but as mentioned before, this dynamic of replacing pasture could mean that cattle actually is moving further into forested areas. And um, there, is, there are cases of illegal expansion of palm oil plantations into, into the Amazon, um, which in the absence of, of effective law enforcement means um, that it uh, can move into areas together with pastures, with illegal roads, with illicit coca crops, and um, spreading further into forested areas. Also in the Choco forest uh, on the Pacific coast, there have been um, reports about um, indiscriminate logging as well as smallholder cultivation of palm oil and bananas and coca that are important causes of forest loss and larger scale plantations for um, palm oil production that um, contribute to fragmentation in the edges of the forested areas. In uh, Guatemala, the, Guatemala is also a country that has seen a very rapid forest loss since the early 2000s. And palm oil there has been a, one of the drivers together with cattle ranching, sugarcane and illicit activities. For example, in uh, Piten in the north of the country, there um, is research showing that 17% of all palm expansion replaced natural forests between 2010 and 2019. And also from uh, Alta Verapaz province, there have been um, reports about uh, around 1,500 hectares being converted for palm oil during that time. Um, Brazil, we're going to look at in more detail in a moment. Um, Honduras is a country where, or, um, as I mentioned, a lot of the palm oil expansion has taken place on former banana plantations, but there are also local hotspots where um, old palm um, has encroached into, for example, national parks on the northern coast. And in Peru, where um, Amazon deforestation has been linked to palm oil expansion. The next slide, please. Um, yeah, and next to uh, environmental concerns, which are also linked to, for example, contamination of water, um, watersheds, and um, uh, impacts from pesticide use. A very important um, um, impact from, from palm oil expansion is um, related to social issues, to land disputes, to breaches of indigenous and local communities' rights, and of um, in some countries like Ecuador, um, Afro-descendant communities. This is something that has been observed in, in several countries across the continent. 
um, this leads to displacement and as a consequence also, also a lack of food sovereignty, uh, a criminalization of land rights defenders, which has also led to, to violence against uh, land rights defenders in several countries. Um, and yeah, there's, there's several, several underlying reasons for that. There's countries like Colombia with a long history of internal conflicts, displacement and unequal land distribution, which is still um, a, an issue until today um, with large numbers of displaced and dispossessed people that lack access to land. Um, and yeah, some of that land has been taken over for palm oil plantations. Uh, in Ecuador, it is, um, there are various reports about the fact that Afro-descendant communities are especially affected by land conflicts linked to oil palm cultivation. They often lack the rights to ancestral lands while they are at at the same time, not benefiting economically from the expansion of palm oil cultivation. And uh, recent research that um, has been published by a Dutch labor union, CNB, has documented labor rights issues in, in several Latin American countries, which are still yeah, very, very widespread. Um, it is difficult to, to obtain very detailed data on some of the issues, for example, the fact that um, there's a lot of work in mills outsourced to subcontractors, which often involves migrant workers, which work under very, under very um, difficult and insecure conditions with short-term contracts that prevent unionization. Um, often in, the, in, in many of the countries, labor laws are not applying to the agricultural sector, which makes it much more difficult to, to um, ask for, for for yeah, like legal um, um, support. Um, there's a lack of decent wages that can cover living costs. That's a, a huge issue that's not only applying to palm oil, but to many other agricultural crops as well. Um, and um, yeah, the, the, the overall issues that are observed are in, certain, in some of the countries also seen as a driver of um, migration because of the, the lack of access to land or food scarcity and badly paid jobs that are quite widespread and, and make it very hard to make a living for many people. And it, yeah, it remains to be seen in how far and how quickly sustainability commitments will solve these issues. Um, and yeah, that is something that, that clearly needs to be um, followed more. Um, it also means that there is a very clear case for due diligence, including environmental performance, and importantly, also addressing these social and labor rights issues, which requires transparency on how risks are identified, policies to protect labor rights in practice, um, safeguards against uh, retaliation towards human rights defenders, and importantly, also remedy provisions for affected uh, individuals and communities. And with this, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Sarah, who is going to look in more detail at the situation in Brazil. Yes, thank you, Barbara, for setting this context. So in uh, Brazil, palm oil production is uh, largely uh, presented as a green solution. And we, uh, we will question whether this is indeed the case. So in this presentation, that will last around 15 minutes. And then we have a few minutes more from Gerard. And then the floor will be opened for, uh, for questions. Uh, I will hopefully answer whether the claims of Brazil's palm oil industry are valid. Um, so the, the claims are that they are safeguarding the Amazon because they uh, largely depend plant on areas that are already degraded uh, or on areas that were already cleared before 2008. So as Barbara already mentioned, and that's also important to realize is that uh, the majority of produ production uh, takes place in the Amazon. So uh, in Para, especially 82% of, uh, of all production of palm oil is, uh, is occurring. Um, so they also claim to create numerous local jobs and promote family farming. And finally, that, uh, that palm oil based biodiesel can be a solution uh, towards a low carbon economy. So as a first answer, yes, uh, I think many of these claims are, are more or less valid, especially as uh, chain reaction research also uh, could confirm that expansion also yeah, took 
place mainly on uh, on degraded areas. And, and in that sense, it definitely has a relatively lower environmental impact uh, compared to soy and beef. For instance, uh, Abro Palma, the, the Brazilian Palmo Producer Association, estimated that uh, in Para alone, 20,000 jobs were directly create, created and uh, 60,000 jobs indirectly. Uh, also, there is a recent uh, WWF report uh, of uh, WWF uh, Brazil that that claims that indeed uh, that biofuels uh, with palm oil as a, as a feedstock can be an option to reduce uh, dependency on uh, on fossil fuels, uh, but only and and that's really uh, the the claim. It, it's only the case if there is no uh, new land converted for uh, for oil palm expansion. And that's unfortunately also something that we uh, we could see and that we have uh, have described in the report is that uh, also we saw that oil palm expansion has been linked to deforestation, fires, the loss of biodiversity, exploitive labor conditions, and land disputes. And that's what I'm going to present uh, about in the next slide, please. So chain reaction research found that uh, there was more than 1,000 hectares of deforestation between 2008 and 2020 uh, on the plantation of, uh, of nine key palm growers in Brazil. Um, and then the, the big question is, of course, is this a lot or not? Um, it is not compared to, again, for instance, looking at soy production linked deforestation. Uh, I, I looked up an old chain reaction research pro uh, report that say, said that, uh, for instance, in 2020 alone, more than 200,000 hectares were cleared in the Cerrado, and that was linked to uh, to soy production. Yeah, so comparing these numbers, this is this is not a lot of deforestation, but this deforestation is taking place in the Amazon, which is of course a tropical rainforest, and we know there's also a stricter regulation there. So 80% of the area needs to be uh, set aside as a legal reserve or, or permanent preservation area. And, and we saw that this deforestation especially uh, took place actually in these legal reserves and, uh, and preservation areas, 74%. So this is all likely illegal deforestation. There are some exceptions, but this is generally uh, illegal deforestation. Uh, and also from this figure, you can see that uh, Brazil Biofuels, which is the largest uh, Brazilian uh, palm grower, they are actually the ones most uh, involved in deforestation. And also the majority was cleared uh, quite recently in 2019 and 20. Next slide, please. So in the report, we, uh, we basically assessed three uh, palm producers in Brazil. Um, not all of them are the largest, so Brazil Biofuels and Agropalma, they are in the, the top three of largest uh, palm producers in Brazil. Palma Plan, they are not, they are relatively small, but they have been included because both Palma Plan and, uh, and Brazil Biofuels, they are expanding in a new area in Roraima, so that's also an Amazon state. Uh, and you can imagine that with new expansion, also there is more risk for uh, social and environmental impact. So that's why they were also included. So just uh, a few basics about these companies. So Brazil Biofuels acquired by Bio Palma, um, the palm oil arm of mining company Vale in 2020. They say that all the oil palm they are going to produce is used for uh, power generation. Uh, Agropalma is the largest exporter of Brazilian palm oil, so they export around 50% of its production, mainly to the EU. But as Barbara also already showed, Brazil is a net importer of, of palm oil, so they don't export that much. But Agropalma is the biggest exporter. They are the only seller of uh, RSPO certified oil. Um, there are uh, two other uh, palm growers that are also RSPO member but only Agropalma is actually really selling the, the certified palm oil. Uh, Palma Plan is part of Oleo Plan, which is the second largest biodiesel company in Brazil. And it's also producing its oil palm for, uh, for its new power generation plant in, uh, in Roraima. 
So looking at the outcomes of the environmental assessment, and in the next slide, I will talk about the social assessment. Um, but on the combined properties of these three growers, 91% of all deforestation occurred in the property of uh, Brazil biofuels, uh, of which 76% was potentially illegal, uh, and more than half was uh, occurring in 2019 and 20. So we also did the fire analysis on the, on the properties of these three growers. And there you can see that particularly in the properties again of Brazil biofuels, there were a lot of fire alerts. Compared to, for instance, Aco Palma, there were only 17 fire alerts in 2020, which was a peak year of, uh, of fires. And there were 165 in the one uh, from uh, Brazil biofuels. Also in Palma Plan, there were 75 fire alerts, which is quite a lot if you compare to the small management uh, size of, of, the, of the farm. Um, deforestation in agro Palma farms has been neglectable since 2008. Uh, while there was some deforestation detected, I believe 38 hectares, uh, we visually confirmed that there has been no new plantings of any uh, oil palm in these uh, areas. So actually Agro Palma was the only one found to have no deforestation. And in the Palma plan, we did uh, find 58 hectares of deforestation in 2008 in, in its uh, Roraima location. So there are then also uh, at least cases of, uh, of pesticide contamination. And the most notable one is uh, the one linked to Brazil biofuels, which is also a, a lawsuit. Uh, and that what's happening in the Ture Mariquita Indigenous Reserve with uh, an estimated 27,000 people uh, that are affected. Uh, also, there was a, a least presence of a chemical in the waterways near Agro Palma's oil plantations in, uh, in Para, although uh, Agro Palma denied. Next slide, please. So now looking at the social assessment, um, Again, uh, Brazil Biofuels had seen numerous unresolved land conflicts with local communities. Um, there is an estimated number of 17,000 hectares of its land holding uh, in Para that are undocumented or are illegitimate. Um, also, in, the, in both plantations of Brazil Biofuels and Agro Palma, there are reports of uh, poor working and exploitive labor conditions. Uh, and in the case of Brazil Biofuels, there are also very recent uh, conflicts with security staff and, uh, and farms reported. Um, just, yeah, in terms of labor conditions, uh, what is specifically important to mention is that many farmers are engaging in a very long term contracts with these palm growers, like for 25 years, they rent their land to the, to the palm producers. And in exchange, they receive also supplies like seeds and uh, fertilizers. But apparently many uh, farmers get also indebted uh, to, to, these, uh, to these growers. Uh, and this creates kind of dependency relationships. Um, also, the, the, the report that Barbara also mentioned from CNV International and Profundo says that there is a huge gap between uh, what you generally see in, uh, in palm oil refiners policies and how actually the, the labor conditions are at the plantations uh, and how they are identified and how they are addressed. Um, finally, in the Palma plan, the 58 hectares of deforestation I mentioned that was only about 10 to 15 kilometers away from, uh, from two indigenous territories. And while it is not necessarily the case here, um, what you generally see is that if demand for the land increases, there's also uh, an increase often in invasions in, uh, in indigenous territories. So on the right side, uh, I have listed some of the recent buyers of, uh, of palm oil from these growers that we were able to identify on the basis of uh, public mail lists. And it's good to, to realize that also biofuel clients are will probably be buyers, but uh, they don't publish on their palm oil sourcing list, so they are not included here. Next slide, please. 
So going back to the first question, whether indeed these claims of the industry are true. So one of the claims is that palm oil palm expansion is only taking place in areas that are already long ago uh, degraded. But actually what we saw is that it's also happening in deforestation frontier areas. So especially if we look at the uh, Roraima, which is known for its tropical rainforest, this is really the, the latest expansion area for palm oil. And here on the figure on the right, you can see this uh, typical fishbone structure. And you often see that in, in tropical rainforest where there's a lot of uh, recent deforestation going on. And you can indeed see that although the, the structure has been observed already for some years, you can see that there's also a lot of recent deforestation uh, ongoing. And you see the properties of Palma plan in purple and the one from Brazil biofuels in yellow that are really in, uh, in these structures and in these regions. Although we did not see any deforestation after 2009 in their properties here, uh, they are still in a region that is really in a frontier area, area and where there's a lot of deforestation going on. And also Palma Plan and Brazil Biofuels have indicated that they have uh, that they will considerably scale up their uh, production in this state. Uh, next slide, please. So finally, uh, also there are indications found by us uh, for indirect deforestation. So the general concern is that um, with palm oil development, there is also uh, an increasing pressure on uh, surrounding areas to clear land. Um, and uh, yeah, this is actually another factor putting pressure on, on land apart from cattle production, soil cultivation, dams and mining. Um, so basically uh, what happens often is that the search for cleared land pushes uh, cattle ranches, soy producers and land uh, developers even further in the, in the Amazon. So while we could not really prove with hard evidence, what, what you do see in this picture is, uh, is the area between the, the palm plantations of Brazil biofuels in, uh, in yellow and um, Agro Palma in blue. And you can see that there's quite some deforestation in between uh, the properties. Uh, so there's no proof that this is linked to palm oil expansion, but you can imagine that, uh, that it is putting extra pressure on the surrounding areas. Next slide, please. So one key conclusion here is that uh, due diligence remains uh, essential for any buyers or fast moving consumer good good companies that, uh, that buy from these uh, Brazilian palm growers to avoid any violations of their uh, no deforestation, no peat and no exploitation uh, commitments. Uh, next slide. And this is my last slide as well. So this is also increasingly uh, relevant with the, the upcoming uh, new deforestation laws uh, on, on due diligence, for instance. Uh, especially, uh, we have showed in this presentation that, uh, that there are quite some social and environmental impacts linked to uh, Brazil biofuels. Uh, and here in this table, you can see some of the, the buyers of their uh, palm oil. And they, they are likely uh, to violate their, uh, no, their NDPE uh, commitments if they continue to source from these uh, companies. That was my presentation. I now uh, hand over to uh, Gerard, who is going to talk about the uh, financial risks. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Sara and uh, Barbara. Uh, next slide. Yeah, this, this is the slide. Thank you. Um, well, what, uh, what does this mean for, for uh, finances uh, and that are banks, investors, uh, like uh, shareholders and bondholders? Um, how are they involved in this whole, uh, whole chain? All companies in the Latin America palm oil supply chain do face risk in case of deforestation, legal and illegal uh, deforestation. And if you like, if, if you take a look to the, uh, to the various risks that are faced plantations, they are mainly faced if they are linked to uh, illegal and legal deforestation uh, uh, with uh, the main risk is stranded assets. Uh, they, they can face market access risk also and financing risk. Um, traders, uh, they are uh, 
as well as the, the market access risk, financing risk, but also some legal risk is here coming in and reputation risk. While the fast moving consumer good industry, their main risk is reputation risk. And uh, they also face increasing legal risk. And I come back to that uh, uh, later on. And uh, finally, the financiers, well, they, they will, uh, they can face value at risk, they can lose money. Uh, they can also face uh, legal risk. And of course, uh, yeah, they can lose, uh, they can lose clients and they, uh, uh, because of, uh, of reputation risk. Well, special attention uh, uh, here is for, 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 for the legal risk element. And this, uh, this is strongly increasing. Um, as we have seen in recent uh, announcements by the European Union, uh, there is upcoming uh, European Union regulation on deforestation, uh, deforestation free products, uh, and also on the due diligence of supply chains. So this is really getting an, 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 a, a larger um, issue for, uh, for companies uh, within the European Union importing material from Latin America, but also some regulation also, of course, applies to uh, local activities uh, by European companies in Latin America and other parts of the world. Um, another special attention is for the growing biofuel chain. Uh, well, Barbara already showed that it is around uh, that, that, that palm oil for, for, for biofuel diesel is already around 20%. Globally, the number is uh, higher. It is uh, in 2020, it was around 23%. Um, and uh, the problem of this strongly growing uh, uh, downstream uh, part of the, of the palm oil uh, chain is that most companies in this part of the, bio, of the chain, the biofuel companies, big oil, they are mixing energy companies, they are using uh, uh, palm oil for, for, for energy pr uh, production, and uh, they lack transparency. Uh, there, there, there is an absence of palm oil, oil lists, as you have seen uh, uh, in the sheets of uh, Sarah and, uh, and Barbara. You only see fast moving consumer good companies. They are moving quite quickly in showing transparency on this. But the uh, energy companies, the other uh, companies that source palm oil, they don't have palm oil millies. So there's a lack of transparency here. These companies often have no zero deforestation policies. And well, that combination, of course, uh, it's already 23% of the global market. Uh, that is That creates an enormous leakage market for palm oil that, can, that is uh, linked to deforestation. Um, the cost of implementation of the zero deforestation policies and a best in class monitoring verification system that, that should not be the reason for this kind of companies to have no transparency. And um, uh, the, 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 the implementation and the execution, that's only a fraction of the profits. If you look to the cross profits realized by, uh, by the biofuel companies um, on palm oil, on embedded palm oil, well, the, the, the gross profits are 2.4 billion globally, while the operating profits are 1.4 billion globally. And as I already said, the, the, the implementation execution of a good best in class uh, and a zero deforestation policy is a fraction of this. So with this, I like to hand over to Matt. Hey, thanks a lot for that, Gerard. Um... We'll now go to the Q&A part of the event. Um, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A function and we'll try to answer, answer them in the time that we have left. Um, I have noticed that we've had some questions for us to share um, the side presentations with some people in the audience. We have our emails right here um, on the screen. So if you would like um, a copy, just please send us um, a message after um, after the event, and we'll be um, happy to send that to you. And also, we will be um, putting this presentation, a video recording, online in the next uh, next couple of days. So now on to the Q and A. Uh, the first question is uh, for you, Harard. 
Uh, you said that zero deforest zero deforestation monitoring and execution costs are a fraction of embedded palm oil. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the question. Um, we have in one of our chain reaction research uh, studies, um, and, and you can find them on, on the web, we have calculated what it might cost to, uh, to, 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 to have a best-in-class uh, zero deforestation uh, and execution uh, monitoring verification uh, of this uh, of such a policy. Well, it and 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 uh, the percentage of price increase for a fast-moving consumer food company like Procter and Gamble or Unilever uh, that is in the low single digits. It is uh, we calculated it at that time that to 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 put it in place uh, for 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 a downstream company. Uh, like Procter & Gamble, they would have to increase the sales price of an, a head and shoulders shampoo bottle from three, year, three US dollars to around three US dollars. So nearly no change. And overall in the whole food chain, it, is, it might, might lead to at most, let's say around one and a half to 2% price increase um, in, 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 in the, on, the, on the retail level. So it are very low price increases that uh, that has to be executed in, in the biofuel chain. I already showed the, uh, the, the, the gross profit numbers and the operating profit numbers. Also here, the, uh, the necessary price increases are, and then you, uh, because the product is also mixed, of course, with uh, fossil fuels of the end product, now that's, that's really, really minimal. You cannot see it. Great, uh, thanks for that, Harard. Next question is for Barbara. I'm talking about um, expansion on forested land. If it's cheaper to expand there, why is most of the expansion mostly taking place on converted land? Thanks, Matt. Um, well, I would think that, um, well, I would, I, would, I would still trust that that also a lot of um, uh, of the actors in the palm oil supply chain are, are aware of the fact that deforestation is not the best way to go. So in that sense, I think that is one of the explanations. <laughs> um, and uh, it's all obviously also not the same situation in every country. This is, yeah, uh, this is uh, an observation in some countries. In others, there's already so much more forest converted that obviously that is also a bit of a different situation, but it is one factor among several, I would say. Great, thanks a lot for that. Uh, next question is for um, either Sarah or Barbara. Um, is it possible you could talk more about the Brazilian biofuel NDP commitments? Do they have rigorous policies in place that are poorly implemented or do they just simply not have a policy? Sorry, Barbara, can you answer that? I haven't looked at the policy of Brazil biofuel, sorry. Yeah, maybe I can answer on that. Uh, um, uh, last week we released a chain on, uh, on the chain reaction research website on the policies of the, um, the, the zero deforestation policies of biofuel and energy companies. And yeah, that is really an enormous omission. Um, so as some companies have, have, have something, in particular in uh, Petamina has, uh, has such, a, such a policy, but its um, execution is something different, of course, is something else. Uh, however, it's, uh, uh, in general, these companies have not yet thought about this. Um, while uh, fast-moving consumer co food companies have been confronted with this issue already for the last 10 years, um, these companies uh, are, ne are yeah, never, never uh, asked for that by their, uh, by their banks, by maybe not by their investors and, 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 and by, their, uh, uh, by, other, by, other, by, by NGOs. So th that, is, that is still an issue that has to develop and that will probably develop with the larger the biofuel uh, segment gets, then uh, also uh, uh, finances will ask more, uh, 
increase from this. Great, thanks for that, Gerard. Uh, next question is about the impact of EU regulation on Latin American palm oil. Um, how do you envision um, the EU regulation impacting the Latin American palm oil market and particularly um, smallholders and traders? Well, yeah, um, there will certainly be impact in the sense that buyers will have to do a lot more due diligence. Um, and um, with this, um, yeah, the, it, it will be increasingly a problem if um, the, the requirements under these kind of regulations cannot be fulfilled. Um, yeah, I think um, part of it certainly, as we mentioned before, uh, uh, actually quite a lot of the issues in the uh, supply chain from Latin America are social issues. So there will certainly be a lot more due diligence on human rights issues and labor rights issues, um, which could lead uh, increasingly also to, to companies who cannot fulfill these requirements being delisted as suppliers. It has happened in the past and that could become more of an issue if there are very clear legal requirements in, for example, the European market. Great, thanks for that, Barbara. Next question is for Sarah. Could you speak about the issue um, could you go a little deeper on the issue of indirect deforestation? Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, because one of the the question was, uh, I know it's from uh, from the representative of uh, Agropama because uh, it's important to realize that we have uh, we have uh, sent the report to all the the palm growers that were assessed. So uh, we have also had very nice and uh, lively discussions. Um, uh, and there's a question about the indirect deforestation um, because uh, what he is saying is that what happens in the agro palma case uh, is that it protects well its forest because uh, deforestation seems to happen uh, just around. Uh, and it sees the, the case that if Agropama was not there to protect its forest, deforestation would be uh, yeah. happening uh, around and also inside. Um, so, as I already said, uh, we don't have hard evidence that indeed this indirect deforestation uh, exists. Uh, we only hint to the fact that this might be the case, especially uh, if we are familiar with uh, general land investment dynamics where we, uh, we often see is that, uh, for instance, in the case of Roraima, there the land is still quite cheap and, uh, and abundant. So what happens is that, uh, for instance, cattle ranchers, they, uh, they deforest land and then they, uh, they quickly go to the next area where it's still cheap to, to, uh, to converse new land. Um, and also what we have seen in the past in Para, of course, uh, palm oil production is already uh, existing for a longer period uh, compared to Roraima. But what you see there is that uh, when, when the palm oil companies arrived in, uh, in Para, there was a rise of uh, land prices and speculation that increased significantly. Um, yeah, so what, what happens is then that there's becoming more pressure on, on the surrounding areas for clearing the land. So that's a dynamic that we have seen in Para in the, in the past, and that is now likely also going to be in, uh, in, uh, in Roraima. Um, yep, yeah, that was my answer. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, could, the, the next question is about the potential impacts of the NDP market on smallholder production and how to um, address this issue um, given the limited capacity and resources of smallholders. Yeah, there, there's, there's clearly a case for, for support for smallholders in um, being able to, to fulfill these requirements. That's something that you also see in Southeast Asia, that, that's, that is often um, a problem um, because smallholders indeed often simply do not have the resources to, to, for example, replant on the same land and to 
to um, to be able to afford the costs of waiting for maturity of new plantations instead of um, moving into other areas because simply there isn't enough money available to make up for that period without income so that yeah that clearly needs um yeah smart solutions to to support smallholders in that to provide cheap uh, loans to yeah make sure that um that improvements can be made without um, leading to, for example, new conversion of land. There's obviously also issues observed like child labor in smallholder um, production, simply because the 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 income from from the 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 yields that they have is not high enough, which is certainly also a, a big problem that needs to be solved, and which is connected to to the prices being paid and the, the profits being made by small farmers. Yeah, maybe maybe interesting to add to that. We have uh, in chain reaction research reports, we have made calculations on the costs of this uh, gap in the smallholder cash flow to renew their, uh, uh, their trees. And in the profit chain report, there are some, um, uh, on the chain reaction research website, there are some interesting numbers there and if you uh, look to the uh, the size of the profits that are made on embedded palm oil in the palm oil chain um, by fast moving consumer good companies by biofuel companies and by retailers then there is an enormous um, then this this whole replanting and uh, financing the gap in the cash gap in the cash flows for these smallholders when they are replanting that is such a small part of the profits that are made downstream that yeah this kind of mechanism should be uh, set up by the uh, by the by, by the downstream sector great thanks for that uh Herard and barbara so we're now out of time and i'd like to thank the panelists Herard, barbara and sarah and everyone who joined us today we apologize if we didn't get to your question, um, but please feel free to reach out to any of us and we can keep the dialogue going. So thanks a lot and happy holidays, everyone.